Hello and welcome to Chopped Greens. I am your host, Philip Amrine, joined alongside Luke. Very, very wrong. That's just rude. So, I just want... I'm, I'm writing an obituary about your playoff predictions, and I just want to see what, what quote or what caption would you want on your gravestone? PJ tuckered out? Um, nope. Ten points stronger? Nope. Uh, the ha- the kids were hot. Were, when were they hot? Was it against Milwaukee were. in like game, what, two, were. one? I mean, we're not talking about literal kids. We're talking about the, it's it's a it's a metaphor. Mm-mm. They were actual kids compared to LeBron James. That is a man right there. Mama, don't stop that man. Wow. Sorry, I must eat because I am actually starving. So, forgive me, Chopped Greens fam. I am eating a, what I think is a hamburger right now, but I'm sure it will not deter anybody from listening because I do not chew with my mouth open. But you know who is gross? The Boston Celtics. Uh, Yeah, I think that's one of very many words you could use to describe Disgusting. Not just Boston, but really the playoffs. Okay, so all of okay, the okay, okay, okay. So let's let's go to somewhere more <laughs> digestible. Uh, so when we go to Game Seven in the uh, semi conference finals, okay. um, Wizards, Bradley Beal and John Wall. Well, actually, Bradley Beal shows up. Yeah. John Wall is uh, not so much. He showed up in the second half. Second half, he was respectable. It was kind of kind of a repeat of Game Six almost, yeah. except he didn't nail the buzzer he, beat he or win. He just didn't have enough in the tank to get through that that end of the fourth quarter. Where do the Wizards go from here? Let's start with the Wizards because okay. now their offseason begins. They're very late in the process. They have two superstars, almost like the Portland Trailblazers, but where do they get better? How do they get better? I think what they need is a very good wing player. They need somebody better than Otto Porter (laughs) or Kelly Ombre Jr. They need a bona fide scorer at the three position, someone who can come off the bench even. They don't even necessarily need them as a starter, but they need somebody who can help that bench with scoring because that bench did not do them any favors towards the end of that series or you know some they had a few big games but overall not um a very strong factor for them so i think that that's where they need to improve at beal is going to continue to progress you might want to get some more depth at the center slash power forward position i'm not sure martin gortat is only getting older he's only getting older. that hammer is getting rusty yeah and I think that now, this is such a deep draft, you probably will be able to get a, a good piece, even with the late first round pick. Um, so overall, I think Washington is in a very good position going forward. As long as Beal continues to develop like he has been, as long as Markeith doesn't start creating problems like he did in Phoenix, and as long as either Porter develops into more or they get somebody who can be that number three scoring option on the team right i'm i'm not exactly 100 percent sure of their cap situation it would i mean the the default really here is that almost every team that we talk about and how they get better most of that could be gordon hayward or we'll be bantering around the same players right jimmy butler what team does he go to that makes it worse, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very rare. So, theoretically, if the Wizards were to somehow finagle their way into getting Gordon Hayward, they're better, right? Yeah. But, unfortunately, they're still lacking depth. Which, when you're a team that's not as top-heavy as other top-heavy teams, so the Golden State Warriors don't really have that much depth. They do have some, some pieces. Their uh, backup point guard uh, can... Provide scoring off the bench. Andre Iguodala and Sean Livingston are enough to carry that bench. It's about seven deep. It's almost akin to what the Rockets roll out where they don't have a deep bench, but they have enough of a bench to substitute as points. Uh, So when we look at the Wizards, 
they're in a very precarious situation because they're not young enough to really be young. Because at least the, the trailblazers, you can argue, they're young. They're young. They're young. They're going to grow into something, especially with Nurkic. Everybody seems to be high on him. Damian Lillard is certainly young. CJ McCollum is certainly young. They will grow up. And what you're hoping for if you're the Trailblazers is that, is that when they reach that final maturation point, they will be good when the Golden State Warriors are coming down. Mm-hmm. So that way you're no longer blockaded by that impenetrable force that is the Golden State Warriors are hoping, hint, 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 that, the, that Kevin Durant will go back to the Oklahoma City Thunder, He's whatever. Back to the Thunder. You don't think that's a possibility? No. All right, don't get me sidetracked. Don't get me sidetracked, but the Portland Trail Blazers, that's what they're hoping for. The Wizards aren't really there. Walls, this is he's a middle-aged player. He's getting towards that apex point, that point where he is at the absolute peak of peaks for a player, and yet he doesn't particularly have anything to show for it. And it's not exactly like it's his fault, right? We're not blaming him. It's just he doesn't have enough around him. If you're John Wall, do you start looking towards greener pastures? Do you start asking for... I mean, what can you do if you're the Kyle Lowry's of the world, the Gordon Hayward's of the world? Do you just stand pat? I think it really depends on how much you trust your own management. I think John Wall is in a position where he trusts his management. They got him Bradley Beal. They got him Markeith Morris. They managed to... Gortat turned into a good piece. Otto Porter is a pretty good piece, and you know he would be great as a sixth man coming off the bench to be your third scorer and bring someone else into that starting unit or something along that case. So he trusts his management, so I think he can stay. Same thing with Gordon Hayward. The Utah Jazz have proven that if he stays, they can start to build between him, Favors, Gobert. Those Utah, that, the Utah Jazz are only, I think, a piece and some experience away from being able to do even, compete even more in the Western Conference. You know, they should have been a fourth seed if we're if we're being realistic. Of they, course. They're they're un they what is the word? They they r- have risen above their status. Yes. For lack of a better term. And so I think that it really like Kyle Lowry I think is also in a unique position where people don't know what he is worth. Because he shows up in the regular season and has above average to good regular season stats. And then when the postseason hits, he just disappears. And it's not once or twice. It's typically in a seven-game series, he's only going to show up for you maybe twice. A quarter. Like two quarters of the series. Not even two games. He doesn't show up in the playoffs. And so you can't trust him. And he needs to accept that fact. And he needs to go to a team where he is not going to be the second option behind another guard. Right. I liken that to Andre Iguodala. It's it's hard to, to remember it to a point where he was, but he really was the star of the Philadelphia 76ers at a time. And it was amazing at at some point that he went to the Golden State Warriors, that they maxed him out at the time of whatever that amount was. It was much lower than what a current max is right now. However, when Steve Kerr went, that was one of his first moves is to send Andre Iguodala to the bench. He's like, I know you're our number one paid star. You know, know, I know that we really should be playing you. But I need you to be the leader of that bench. That's where you're best served. If Kyle Lowry can take a, a, a little teaspoon of that humble pie and really find something, Andre Iguodala, I think, has risen above his rank as notor- not notoriety, really. He's kind of become now associated with winning and the Golden State Warriors. He's gotten a championship, otherwise he would not have. Mm-hmm. And I think when we look back on this team, it's not necessarily going to... Uh, what is it? Andre Iguodala is not going to be an afterthought. He'll be one of the core four for the original team. And then he's part of that death lineup that everybody's like, oh, how are you going to guard Iggy? I mean, he was even an MVP yeah. of, of the finals. I mean, that's unbelievable that a role player, that was so incredibly unheard of. He was the first uh, non-starter of the finals to win an M- of a person who did not start every single game of the finals to win an MVP. Kyle Lowry, I think that's that's the role he's got to be looking for. I don't think he takes it because if you can garner that much money, 
Uh, it's very rare. It's very rare that you would both accept that amount of money and take a step back on, on a team status because if you're making that much money, normally the team demands that of you anyways. And you yourself, if you're truest of a, a, the highest of highest competitors, you're not going to just relegate yourself to, oh, yeah, I'm fine with a, with a role player status. Yeah. And just for clarification's sake, John Wall now has two more years on that deal. He signed a five-year deal back in the 2013-2014. Uh, he also made a second-team All-NBA, so he's in line for the player max. a huge, an even bigger player max. Yes, the so designated he, player max. Yeah, if he stays with of course, uh, that's Washington. not. Of course, that's not until his contract year. They have to make it within the year that their contract. Yes, but, up. but it's, but it's it indicative of that. With Washington, of he course, can. and he was drafted by Washington. Yeah. That's the big. That's one of the big reasons why when people look at that Demarcus Cousins deal and how did he lose thirty million dollars just being traded? That's how it, that's he how. he was no longer a part of the Sacramento Kings, the organization that drafted him. Yes, so that also plays a part in why these players. Tend to want to stay now, and it's it's just a lack of forty million dollars. I, however, I think if you're a good enough player and you're not injury prone, that's not a huge detriment. It depends on player to player. Blake Griffin is going to take as much money as he can and rob the bank to to, to satisfy his future. I but, think he goes to Thunder. Ew. Going back home. Ah, oh, but home, where when home is a is. Potatoes in a silo. Who wants to go back that's, home? That's rude. My dad's from Oklahoma. God bless him. Where is he now? Here. Yeah, I don't see. I don't see him. Yeah, it wasn't his choice. <laughs> Boomer sooner. Well, God bless him. I mean, I think you know Russell Wilson can stay loyal to the team that drafted him. Bob Stoops can stay loyal to the team that doesn't seem to want to fire him. But if you have a choice to not go to Oklahoma City Thunder, unless. And this is a rumor I've been thinking about that I, I've been trying to... Oh, what's the word LeVar Ball's used? I try, I'm trying to secrete it into the, the ether, the universe, to make it become true. Luke, I'm trying to make it become true. Follow me here. KD, Kevin Durant, Golden State Warrior, wins a ring this season. I don't like it because then I don't get to pick what you lose as a punishment, but that's not the point right now. He wins a ring... He's now satisfied that need to get a ring in order to validate his career. Says, Russell, we've kissed to make up this playoff. You got the MVP. You're solidified in your status as a big dog. I'm obviously a big dog myself. Let's go. Let's go. No. Bury the bone. No. Let's go to Oklahoma City, finish this thing out together. Even if we don't win a ring, I'm satisfied. You're loyal. Come on, man. Come on! Everyone keeps saying as if Durant cares that much about Oklahoma City. Do people not realize that Oklahoma City didn't draft Durant? Seattle Supersonics. Yeah. Do people not realize that um, Kevin Durant wasn't born in Oklahoma? People keep trying to Maybe make Kevin Texas. Durant... No, he was born in Maryland. That's correct. He was He's from the East Coast. He played he, in he Texas. Played in Texas. Yeah, he, okay. he went to college in Texas. I knew Texas um, was in there. Yeah, but like people keep trying to take what happened with LeBron and force it to these other players. Kind of like a difference. kind of like somebody trying to force somebody to go to Oklahoma City. I'm not trying to force them. I think that's a good move. It fulfills a need almost. It fulfills a need for Blake and for Oklahoma City and for Russell. <sighs> It actually makes sense for Blake Griffin to Ew, go to No, it does not. You just hate Blake Griffin. No, You're no. Right. Actually, actually, I, I would say I don't hate Blake Griffin. I hate that... If you're if you're sacrificing and you're you're cashing in and you're going to get money and you're going to get paid more to stay with Chris Paul as opposed to Russell Westbrook, if anything, I don't like Russell Westbrook. But either way, it either makes way. sense from every... It makes sense for the Thunder. It makes, se- it makes more sense for Blake. And it makes sense for... Russell, because now he has another star that he can play with and get farther than what he did this year. Well, anything if, if Blake can stay healthy, anything farther than the but, first round but or even Kevin, the second round. Kevin either. Durant doesn't have any reason to go back to OKC. Russell, that's not a reason. They weren't even particularly great friends no, no, when he was there. They were. I've they heard, were friends. What, what we've heard is that their friends off the court, on the court, they did not get along. And they, okay, that's a good reason not to go back. 
And even then, I've heard reports that they're friends, but not like best friends, not like ride or die friends. It was like, yeah, these guys hung out sometimes after work. I will say Cameron Payne seemed to be the best friend of everybody on that team when he was there and not on Chicago. But when he was there from Oklahoma City Thunder and he had like the, the little Dougie and every other handshake you could imagine, that was insanely cool. But like, I just, I don't, everyone keeps trying to say Durant will go back to OKC, but realistically, there's no reason that he has to go back to OKC. So do you see him finishing out his career in Golden State? I'm not sure on that point yet. I think that it will. E- he'll either stay with Golden State because he seems to have a very good relationship with several people in OKC. When you see him in post-game conferences with Steph Curry and Draymond Green, he's laughing and joking with them. And, I mean, we haven't seen that truly tested in the playoffs yet, but he seems to have good relationships with them. And so it's I, all fun and games when you're up eight and no throughout the rest of the yeah. playoffs. I think ten I, and no, eleven and no. I think a key thing will be who will Golden State pay and who won't they pay? Because everyone keeps talking about super teams, but there's a reason why super teams don't last more than four or five years. Well, who's the one that they kick out? That's that's the thing we don't know, but we also don't know if they lose. So they're they're they have. I tried to start this term earlier today. Every superstar team typically has the big three. Of course. And then the little four. So in, in let's say, the original big three, there was Ray Allen, Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce. Pierce the little, little four, four Rajon Rondo. Rajon Rondo. For Miami, you had... Chris Bosh. LeBron James. LeBron James. You hate him so much you didn't even put him first. How dare you? Yeah. And then (laughs) your little four, Ray Allen for for one of them. The other one was Mario Chalmers. Yeah. For Golden State, there's a little bit of kind of back and forth. Originally, you would say it was Draymond Thompson Curry with uh, Iggy as their little four. Now there's a little more controversy on whether, you know, obviously Durant and Curry are two of your big three. They're, they're your stalwarts. And then I, th- I think, I personally think Draymond is your third one and Thompson's your little four. Clay Thompson, I think it's the stat is now it's three games in a row that he has been outscored by Zaza Pachulia. Yeah. And Draymond impacts that team in a lot more ways than just scoring and guarding one guy. So every- my question is, is can you get the same off the court or the things that, let's say, a Shane Battier, right? Because you're talking about little fours and the other key components. You need like a crazy guy. You need an intangibles guy. The intangibles guy for the Miami Heat was Shane Battier. Mm-hmm. The intangibles guy for the for the Celtics was kind of shared. It was like a little bit of Paul Kevin Pierce, Garnett. Kevin but, Garnett. But it was also maybe Glenn Big Baby Davis, right? Mm-hmm. So... So we have that other guy. That guy seems to be the motor, the engine of the of the team. The guy doesn't care, just wants to win, is Draymond Green. Yes. Can you replicate that? Is that easy to find in no. a veteran's minimum even? Not at all. I think you could find it, but I don't think you'll find it. I don't it think won't you be can as organic? F- yeah. It won't be as organic or it won't be – because right now you have that motor and that, that personality and a productive member. So you don't need to sign somebody just for that role. Right. If you, if you lose sign Draymond, you have to sign a guy. More than likely, that guy will literally his only role will will be that high energy team morale sort of role. Almost like Paul Pierce now with this past year with the Clippers. Clippers. Yes. Where he wasn't able to give you much. Think uh, in the same role, not as a uh, not as far in the playoffs, but Kevin Garnett, especially in yes. Minnesota, who was somewhat of a player coach. Yes. So, I mean, realistically, I could see Kevin Durant going back home to the East Coast, Washington, D.C. He might not want to play against LeBron, but you never know. You know, he might stay with Golden State, they, and Golden State might have to get rid of somebody else. I think that we're going to just see a changing of the guard sooner than people realize. Because super teams... Do not last more than five years. No super team does. It's a combination of. But there's never been there's never been a super team this young. 
Cel- I mean, they keep getting younger because the first one, of course, was the Celtics, of course. Yes. They were really old. <laughs> and they, they came together for one. Arguably, you could argue that another super team was the Lakers before them with um, with Shaq, Kobe, uh, uh, See, I'm not sure Carl that- Malone. You remember that they team? They never won the title. No, they did. That's, that's the thing is that they were another one, but they weren't cemented as that first super team because they didn't win. Um, um, but I, I'm saying is that it's it's now been getting younger and younger as we go along. This new super team is the youngest we've seen yet. But if we look at the teams dissolving, it's never been about age. The Boston Celtics didn't dissolve because of age. They dissolved because one left in free agency and they traded away the other two. Same thing, you know, Miami's super team didn't dissolve because of... Age. It dissolved because LeBron won his titles and he wanted to go back home. Well, but now you're talking about configuring factors. Fact, no. uh, factors of outside forces that you can't contain. I mean, if LeBron James sees their age, then he just dips out a year early rather than a year late. It's not, it's not necessarily but, that they were there till ride or die, much like Larry Bird at the end there where he's... He's dying as he's playing because his back is just given up. But that's my point is there's so many factors that it's almost a guarantee. It doesn't matter how young you are. Eventually, Golden State can't pay them all. Well, I want to attack that point. I think they will. How? How? Do you you think that money just grows on trees? You think that that they're going to be like, oh, I I want all of them? Let me pick some more money here. Okay, I got enough money. I'll, I'll tell pay you, all of you. Let guys. me tell you why most teams have not been able to do this before. The the placement of Steph Curry's under under market sized contract, the the fact that he makes such a slow amount, as well as Draymond Green, because Draymond Green also signed for now what is a considered a bargain for what he does, as well as Clay Thompson, because Clay Thompson also signed around with Draymond Green, if I'm correct. At the same year. Both of their contracts have opt-out clauses. All of them will need a new contract within two to three years. Right. But the fact that they were all so low gave you the ability to add yet another superstar, a proven superstar. No team has been able to organically grow for superstars. If they had, they would keep them. And look at the Lakers of the Showtime Lakers. They had five number one draft picks on the floor at any given time. At the time, there was no luxury cap. There was no cap even. They just kept them all organically because, hey, they're not going anywhere, much like the NFL at the time before their cap. The reason why they don't happen anymore is because of the cap. You're not able to acquire any more great assets unless they're willing to take less than market value, which does not is not guaranteed. And the only reason that it happens is if is the uh, placement of the Warriors on one side of the bracket forces you as the as Bogut to go to the Cavaliers on the other side and say, it's my only shot of actually winning, so I might as well take you know $5 to reestablish my value, regardless of what happened to him, even though he broke down in five minutes. The point is, is that now that you have all five, or now that, excuse me, now that you have all four, you're able to now go over the luxury tax as much as you want. You can. That doesn't mean that they will. Who's going to... Because <laughs> that's a lot of money. Dude, that's still a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but who's paying that bill? The owner, right? The owner... The owner might not necessarily want to keep paying all of that money. Especially if you have to keep... at Because I... The how, luxury much is, tax, how, much, how much is a championship worth to you? How much is a legacy worth to you? How much is it... Do you know how the luxury tax works? I do know how the luxury tax works. And how it doubles. It doubles. And then it doubles more. It does. So eventually, a championship isn't worth it. Let me ask you. Especially because by your logic, you would end up in the luxury tax for like four consecutive years. And then after that, you go on full on take mode. You do trade them away. You very much like the Boston Celtics, you trade them away for inquiring cheaper assets because the era is done. But let me ask you, if you're Steve Ballmer, who's worth, oh my goodness, is it $30 billion? Something like that. Who's Thirty not billion. the owner of the Warriors? Just no, to clarify. no, he's not. But the owner of the Warriors is no. He's he's big in movies. I his name's escaping me right now. I want to say it's Joe Lacob. Lacob. Joe Lacob. Yeah. Joe Lacob. And he um, he is a mogul. And let me tell you, 
those long, where you make your money is for those long playoff runs. If you can make it to the finals. How much do you want to bet right now they will not all be on the same team in five years? In five years, see, in five years. I'll give you four years. Because that's the argument I'm making right now. You're trying to tell me that that super team will last longer than another four years. I could say three. I I say three years is a dynasty because theoretically it's the... I didn't say they couldn't. I said super teams are never around for five years or more. Or never around longer than five years. But isn't the argument... Okay, so then we're getting logistical here because the Warriors themselves have just theoretically added a piece and taken away their bench. So it's it's sort, sort of trading in your bench for what your bench provided in just a physical form of one person. Yeah. So theoretically, they're still... A super team just of a different sort now. Right? I guarantee you mm-hmm. that Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and Draymond Green will not be on the same team in four years. Four years? So that's what? 2021? And I need to find out some ages here before I go because the one that worries me, the one that worries me the most, it's not Steph, it's not Clay, it's not... Draymond. It's the one that worries Durant. me is Durant. I want to say he is 20. Um, he was drafted. Hold on. Don't say it yet. Oh, my goodness. I found it. And you're never going to guess it. Never, ever. Just kidding. You probably will. See. Uh, is he 30? 31? Woo. He's 28. What? Steph Curry's 29. You're, oh, you're, never mind. I got wrong. You're thinking of wrong, LeBron James. No, no, no. I got wrong draft. Oh. Wrong draft. What year was he drafted? Does it say? Uh, was he drafted like 05, 06? He was, he has no, been. No, 07. He was the 07 draft. He was in the 07 draft. Yeah. That I, for some reason, thought he was drafted the year after LeBron. I don't sec- know why. Yeah. I had that math wrong. Okay, so 28. So by, I'm saying he would be around 30, LeBron 32, 32, 30. My like hesitation, my hesitation is Kevin Durant. So your hesitation is the point that I already made as to why super teams don't last But long. theoretically, if you still have that core three, even if Kevin Durant leaves, are they not still a super team that They're not the, the most same games? super team. I didn't say you can't recreate super teams. But then you're talking about a separate super team. But then couldn't. I mean, it just it goes into a whole conundrum there, Luke. You of, could. Of each team that theoretically is they different can, than the past year because try. you're... They can try to what? They can try oh, to try, try to keep all four. Yeah, they, they, no, they can try to build a new super team. Boston couldn't do it. Miami couldn't do it. L.A. sort of did it. If you wanna, but they won all their titles after that. You know, Carl Malone, quote unquote, super team. So I mean, you can say that the Warriors can try to do it, but there have been two other possibilities, and neither of them did it. Well, I don't see Cleveland doing it. Oh, well, <laughs> Cleveland, Cleveland is, this is its one shot in history. It's one bright shining moment. You see it in the NCAA March Bradness of uh, the one shining moment. This is its lone shot in the dark of, okay. of depression to but actually do something. That's what I'm saying is super, there's a reason why, there are several reasons why super teams don't just keep reforming in the same city. Well, of course, but there's, there's something for... If this was this team is so young, and in order to be a super team, you have to have superstars. Part of the reason why they're superstars is their established products. But never before in the league has there ever been this young collected this amount of young collections of superstars. You take the bet. See, Mike, <laughs> it's just Kevin Durant. I'd have to think about it. It doesn't matter what the reason is. No, the the fact is, you don't think that this super team will last that long. You're not confident enough to make the bet. Because super teams, as I've been saying, do not last longer than five years. So even if they were to, uh, let's theoretic, theoretically say, trade, I don't know, Clay Thompson for Jimmy Butler. They're sounding a That's wild a different out. super team. Oh, well then, heck no, I'm not taking your bet. Because what? there's no reason why, if you're, you're, whatever team LeBron James goes to is a super team no. because of LeBron James. No. A super team we are defining as your big three. Okay. And then I like little four. 
But, I mean, you have to have at least the big three. Of course. While, yes, LeBron could potentially form a super team anywhere he goes because more than likely two other stars will follow him. But just because he goes to a team doesn't make it a super team. LeBron didn't make the Cleveland Cavaliers a super team for every single year he was there. He made them a good playoff team that had a shot at making it to the finals. But not every, you wouldn't call the 06 Cavaliers a super team. Kind of connecting it to what we've said earlier, had LeBron James taken less money, had he left enough room in there for their cap space, really all of them, because they all took a pay cut, but not much. It wasn't that big of a... In Miami, I'm talking about. They took enough of a pay cut to, to, to make To make it happen to happen. But what I'm saying is that had he just played for a dollar, or the veterans minimum even, and... At the time, they were bantering around the idea of either adding Carmelo Anthony or Kyle Lowry. Mm-hmm. Had either of those ideas formulated, they would have lasted longer than they did. They would have had a different super team, though. You are killing me, Luke. By stating, I've, I've told you. Are you are so incredibly it, wrong. No, it's no, it's. Who's fact. at the forefront of when, either team if that were to you, happen? When you change something, that makes it different. If it's that's logic. <laughs> When you change something, if it I, is different. Okay, if I have my car and I paint it, even though it has the same inside components, yes, it's cherry red now, it is sparkling and sassy, does not mean that it is, well, you know, I'm going to, it's a new, Actually, I'm going to yes, call it mini. Because depending upon the color, it could be worth more or less. I'll tell you what's worth more or less. Same thing with insurance. Your insurance could cost more or less to bank upon the color of your car. My Give Me 5 is worth 10 times as your less give me five section. That sentence didn't even make sense. Take your L and move on. I will move forward to the other side of this commercial. Red Ribbon Realty Group at HomeSmart is a full-service real estate team of Phoenix natives with over 15 years of experience in the industry. When you work with them, you have two full-time realtors representing your best interests throughout your entire transaction, whether you are selling, buying, or renting. They also believe in supporting their community. Use code word chopped greens and Red Ribbon Realty Group will donate 15% of their net commission from your transaction to the nonprofit charity of your choice. Visit their website at www.redribbongroup.com and find them on Facebook. You can also email them at info at redribbongroup.com or call them at 602-888-6638. Red Ribbon Realty Group. Trust. Commitment. Home. Out of question, and this isn't one of my give me five, would you pay $500 for a pair of shoes? No. How about $200 for a pair of sandals? No. The $200 for a sandal outrages me. It's not even the $500 for shoes because I could see those as collector items. Who pays $200 for sandals? I'm not. Flip flops. I'm not. Flip flops. I'm not. I'm not. I don't, I don't spend more than $3 on flip flops. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, LeVar Ball and Lonzo Ball set out their triple baller brand and and have released the Zo, Zo 2s? I don't even. I think that's what they something, are. Something along those lines. And... These pair of shoes are worth $250 for each shoe, so you can get two lefts, two rights, a left and a right for $500. It's ridiculous. Technically, it's $595, but... No, 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 $495. Sorry, that's what I meant. Yes. I say $595. You said $595. Sorry. Whoa, they're not greedy. All right, here we go. Moving on. It is Give Me Five, not $495. Give Me Five. I, this is the part of the show where I've got five questions for Luke Wright. He's got five questions for me. We don't know what they are. But we will answer them honestly. Luke, I let Gary go first because it was his birthday. It is not your birthday. So I'll go first on this one if that's all right with you. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll allow it. All right, since, for Gary. Do it for Gary. I'll do it for Gary. Do it for Gary. All right, after about 10 minutes of bidding at Sotheby's, the late graffiti artist's Untitled, which was painted in 1982, has set a new auction record for a U.S. artist previously held by Andy Warhol. It was expected to sell for at least $60 million. However, that Basquiat painting has set new records with a $110.5 million sale. Luke, if I asked for you to produce one item that could reasonably sell for millions, what would it be? Not you're, you're still over this price tag. $110.5 oh million. 
It's, uh, I think I can pr- pull it up for you. No, and I, I believe you. No, I, it's not that I don't believe it, but I'm, I, if it was, I was curious as to what it looked like myself. Um, for anybody listening, you really got to look at this photo. It's, it's a, it's a rough, it almost looks like it's made out of Sharpies of a painting of a man, a man's face. And it's, it's incredible that something, cause you see something for $110 million dollars. You just don't believe. Yeah, that's not worth 110 million. Yeah, as he says, as he sees it for the first time, it almost looks like one of those um, Day of the Dead skulls just on a painting. Yeah. Anyways, I'm forcing you to make something. It has to sell for millions. What would it be? What's your best shot? The Mona Lisa. You, you're, you're. <laughs> I'm gonna make the, the Mona Lisa. Lo- the Luke Wright recreation of the Mona Lisa. Now, are you, are you a forger or are you like it's your vision of the Mona Lisa? I'm gonna steal the Mona Lisa. Oh, like the national treasure? Yeah. We're going to steal and the Declaration of Independence. Then I'm going to resell it. Oh, okay. Well, that that could, you know, theoretically get you $110 million. What I'll be making is the plans to Yes, it. yes. You're producing. So that's what I'm the, producing. You're the mastermind. You're, the, you're yeah. the producer of a plan. Got it. Your turn. So, we are now entering a time of change. The football season is unofficially starting with OTAs. Thank the Lord. Basketball is wrapping up. Baseball is kind of still in the middle of its slump, but in the middle of its season. And no slump was appropriate and, yeah. to be completely and, honest. And hockey is also starting to wrap up. So one things that happen a lot, especially with new players entering the league, new new players changing teams, like there are sh- there will be. Tons of new players on teams. Uh, you change your number, your jersey number. Yes. You know, and sometimes, like for college to, to football, for football going from college to pros, like players have to change their number entirely because there's different rules on who can wear what numbers. Or some numbers retired exactly. for that particular team. So my question to you is, what number would you wear on your jersey if you made it on into professional sports? Well, Luke, I'm a quarterback. I always have been, always will be. I'm a winning quarterback. And uh, I got to go with TB12. I actually am 12, though. I do have an association. My birthday's in December, so I would have to go with 12. There's no, I mean, it isn't specifically Tom Brady. It's, and and that's just an aside. He happens to wear it. He's probably the most famous 12 right now. Um, But yeah, 12 would be my number. Uh, is there anybody who's got the cojones to wear in 23? I don't even think... I mean, that hasn't... LeBron wears 23. But, I mean, he's got pretty big cojones. He does. He, he, he's, a, he's a beast of a man. Anyways. All right, T-Pain and Lil Wayne have released their long-awaited T-Wayne project. T-Pain released the 8-track album on Thursday, and the two artists have teased the collaboration for years, and T-Pain revealed that the songs are from 2009. Luke, is there anything in your life that has taken eight years to complete outside of school? And what would you devote eight years of your life to if I forced you to? Um, if you force me to devote eight years of my life to something, I'll go backwards as I try to think of something for the right, first right. part. Uh... There are a few things I devote eight years of my life to. Like hiking, maybe? No. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I have two bad knees, including one major knee surgery. Hiking is not in my repertoire of activities. So maybe swimming, just continuous swimming. Um, I would <laughs> do something nerdy like chess or like... Oh, become like the next Bobby Fischer. Yeah. Maybe not like the anti-Semitic part. Of but course. Everything else. Everything else. Um, maybe writing. Both like novels and articles. Okay. Um, stuff stuff like that. Um, in terms of if anything else is taking me eight years to complete, um, outside of school. Yes, because I, I felt like that would be the standalone answer. I think it it took me eight years, and this is kind of abstract, so I doubt you were looking for this. Do, 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 do. It, it took me eight years to get up the courage to get tattoos. Ah. I started thinking about it at thirteen. And like I was always scared to, and then like as I as I got older and older, I was like, I kind of want one, but it's too painful. And eventually, I was just like, you know what? Forget F it. it. Forget it. Let's go. Let's go get some. 
So now I have seven. I was going to say, I, the, the number one thing I hear about people with tattoos is that after you get that first one, all you see on your skin is an open canvas. Yes. So. It is. I didn't think it, I thought it was weird when people said that getting tattoos was addicting. And then I started getting them and I was like, oh my God. Yeah, there you go. This is addicting. This is addicting. Give me, sign me up for six more, please. Yeah. All right. Your turn. Okay. So. I don't know how much you follow baseball, but there's been a lot of uh, hubba baloo with the Toronto Blue Jays and Atlanta Braves. Yes. Including the throwing around of some homophobic slurs, Mm -hmm. uh, some hitting players in retaliation. And it seems as if, and I haven't been able to positively identify it, but it seems as if the start of this hubba baloo I, you, you're really milking that word, I, aren't you? Oh, I am. You were very proud. You're um, like, what can I... Hullabaloo. Hubbabaloo. But it seems like the start of it... Yes. ...was Jose Batista hitting a single home run in a blowout game at the end of a blowout game and then doing a little backflip. And <laughs> for whatever reason... I think I know where you're going with this, yes. Baseball people absolutely hate backflips. My question to you... Would you ever do a bat flip after a home run? Yes. And I don't know what fuddy-duddies are, are judging this sport and that are just keeping it stuck in the old... Okay, let's let's just have a heart-to-heart here with the old baseball players. You guys, that get rid of these unwritten rules. Don't throw up people's heads with baseballs, which are projectile weapons. I mean, you don't expect going them to... Going upper 90s. Going upper 90s at their head. Yes, they have a helmet that can still do damage if you miss. We just saw that with the Diamondbacks. Hit the guy's frontal face, broke some nose, and broke parts of his teeth. I, it was unintentional. I mean, no. I'll, I'll, add a, I'll add that. But more so than that, uh, you don't see a guy throwing a a bat the same distance at, at the pitcher back just to prove a point or to, to, you know, you take one of our guys, you take one of yours. I am so with bat flipping on, on the more fun side. Baseball needs to revamp. It needs a facelift. It needs something to get people to go to games again. I mean, I, I, I know when me and my family went for Mother's Day, I watched about a half of that game. My sister watched about two innings. My 10-year-old sister, my, well, she's, she's around 10. I won't say 10 because I don't want to give away ages and such. So, but anyways, she, she watched about two innings. My grandma watched all eight and my, my dad saw all eight, but really you're seeing. There's nine innings in the baseball game. Well, yes, I know, but it went, it went a little long. So anyways, eight innings is long for a nine inning game. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. It's a lot. Just ask the selfie girls who saw the Diamondbacks game last year. Anyways, the point is, as you can see that clear delineation, we're living in a different society now. You need to up the tempo. You need to up the excitement. Even more so than the tempo. You just need to up the excitement. Give us something to watch. I couldn't even pick Mike Trout out of a lineup of muscle men. I, I, you just, let's get fun. Back in baseball. I would bat flip literally every single time. I would bat flip even if it's not a home run, just to piss off the pitcher. Even if it was like a single blooper that was more luck than anything else, you can oh. bat. I'm bat flipping. I'm doing a little strip down tease on that yeah. bat. I'm riding that bat pole. Right. Woo! Like one of those toy horses. Like it's, my, it's paying for my next month's rent. All right, Luke, I know that you're itching to be the next big thing, and we'll be delighted to hear about what's new and what's next in fashion. Yes? No. There are new... Already there are know new where this now, is No, actually you don't. There are new now detachable jeans that turn into shorts, and they are the new summer trend. These denim dream makers are set at about 300 pounds in England, and I must ask you, Luke Wright, Will we catch you wearing these in the future? I have a picture for your viewing pleasure. If, they, if I'm hoping it, it changes your opinion because I, 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 I imagine where you're going. But let me try and convince you. Exhibit A. First of all, I'd like everyone to know these, this is, these are women wearing these things. Of course. You made it seem as if this was unisex. It is not unisex. I just thought that hey, you know, maybe it's a maybe it's a maybe you can make it unisex. Well, first of just all, like the those romper. are barely shorts. Like it's more like 
bikini <laughs> bottoms, to be honest. Uh, no, I would. I will not be wearing those, especially not if they're 300 pounds. Oh my goodness, that is crazy. Well, you will be in England. Maybe you can grab yourself I some. I will. I will not be spending. I will not be dropping 300 pounds worth of American dollars <laughs> in on those things. So. Ah, darn it! I tried Chop Green's family. Your turn, Luke. So. Dana White, the president yes. of the UFC, recently has come out and said the McGregor side is done. 50% done. They're 50% done scheduling this fight between McGregor and Mayweather. He's all, he's gotten McGregor to agree to these terms. They are good on, on his side. Now Dana White has turned his attention to Mayweather. And while he has not strictly talked about purses... The only thing that I could get out of Dana White was that he did confirm it would be strictly a boxing match. Mm -hmm. So, assuming that he will be able to get Floyd Money Weather to agree to this fight, are you excited to watch it? Am I excited to watch it? Yes, I am. Even knowing the result, think of the NBA playoffs. I I akin it to this. Even though we know the, the result... And most likely even know the end result because we know that the Warriors and Cavs are going to meet in the finals. And we know that, you know, pretty much that the Warriors will win. Doesn't mean it takes away from the excitement of, but what if? But what if? I know that Conor McGregor is going to lose to Floyd Mayweather. It's going to probably be boring. And you hope, you just you just hope, what if? What if McGregor, the, McGregor can somehow catch Mayweather just once, just once. He stumbles, catches him again. Knocks him out. It's the best thing for the UFC since its inception. Since it sold for, what, $4 billion? Best thing to happen. I, I think you're really not understanding what the best part about this match is going to be. Tell me. It's going to be the build-up. It's going to be the <laughs> hype. It is going to be Conor McGregor talking so much. I'm going to go to and I'm going to ride on horseback. It, it is going to be... Arguably the greatest buildup for a boxing fight in they literally are, decades. It'll be the first time Floyd Mayweather hasn't had to be the only person running his mouth to build up a fight. Yeah. And same with Connor. Connor yeah. really holds up his end of the promotions end of it. Both sides this, are great. It's promoters gonna be the most heavily promoted fight. Yeah. So that's I, what I am so right about that. I, I don't even care how uh, the fight will be because, like you said, I think Mayweather will easily win it on points and not a knockout. It's gonna be boring, but I'm so excited just to, for the build up. But, you are so right, Luke. That is a great point. Excellent. All right, Chris Cornell, who died early this morning. May he rest in peace. Yes, his, his mu- music is spiking in sales on iTunes and Amazon. The leap was, of course, expected after his death, but it's interesting to see what fans are connecting with most. The 20th anniversary reissue of Soundgarden's Super, Unknown, Super Unknown excuse me, is the number one album on iTunes, and his other band, Audio Slave, has the number two spot. Why is it that we as a society have put such an emphasis on buying an artist's work after they die? We have seen it multiple times now with Elvis, Michael Jackson, and even Robin Williams, just to name a few. What is it with this fascination of ours? I think it's really just people want to remember. You know, a lot of people, I don't think, especially for... Musicians? Musicians and Robin Williams, not just their profession, but their time. People don't, especially Michael Jackson and Elvis, Elvis, they were from a time where you didn't have Spotify. You didn't have Pandora. You didn't have easy access to YouTube. People who listened to that music specifically had to buy their albums. Mm. And after literally decades... Most of them probably lost their albums and hadn't listened to them. And, but then, you know, you hear on the news that Michael Jackson died or that Elvis Presley died. And you think, man, they had some really great music. And you have to go out and you buy their album and you listen to it and you reminisce and you're nostalgic. And, and you know, you see this, you know, they were big in the 90s, Chris Cornell and his bands in late and early 2000s. If I'm remembering their, yeah, their, their era. Yeah. You know, they were heavy in the grunge scene, I know, for for a while. You know, people were kind of in that in-between stage of, yeah, people who listen to them are more tech-savvy, but at the time of listening to them, they weren't. 
So it's kind of like, as we realize more and more, it's like, man, I want to go back and listen to them. So you go in and you quickly so, buy their album on iTunes or something just to support them or their family or somebody. So I think that's really what you see. It's just kind of a respect and wanting to remember what they were like. Mm, and so it's kind of a reminiscence of yourself and the time that you first heard it kind of thing. An exactly. experience. All right. Very astute, Luke. Very astute. Your turn. So we actually kind of got into this topic a little bit. Not really into it, but we kind of talked about topics that relate to it. Okay. So you don't have to get too in-depth. But with people like Kevin Durant leaving Oklahoma City, LeBron left Cleveland and then returned. And with people like we talked about Gordon Hayward, Jimmy Butler, John Wall, what are they going to do? Do you think that the NBA tries too hard to keep stars on teams... Because they have that soft cap and so teams can go over and spend a little extra money to pull teams away from the teams they came, pull players away from the teams they came in on. So do you think the NBA tries too hard with these new rules to let, to give teams a better chance at keeping their own players? So, okay. So I, I kind of see what you're saying. All right. I think that that what where they are right now is in a bit of a purgatory. They're kind of stepping their toe in the water, but not fully submerging. I think if you really want to get this problem over with, and they won't do it because they don't want to spend more money, but if you really want to solve this problem of superstars leaving their team that they were originally drafted on or wherever they make it big and really have true parity on the league, what you do is you have one designated player that does not count against your cap. You sign him for whatever you want, and that player can sign for, let's say, the standard five years. That's the max. But for five years or what have you, that player, no matter what you sign him to, does not count against your cap. That way, LeBron James obviously goes and gets whatever he wants anywhere. But it's very hard to recruit somebody like Kyrie, Kevin Love, when Milwaukee, even little Milwaukee, if they're willing to overpay you over whatever else Cleveland can possibly offer you, they're willing to double what Cleveland is offering you. Double. Double. Not even just like we, we talk about players losing $40 million. When we compare that to the rest of their contract, that's really only 20% can be made back in taxes. But if you can go and be the superstar player designated player for some team after your rookie contract's over, oh, that that truly makes te- it. It would allow player movement to happen organically where – Players would like to go and fulfill a role. And the only way that you can really have super teams is if you happen to have a player like LeBron James and get a good draft pick and hopefully him bring him up and mentor him. That is, I think, how you solve the problem. I would even make it simpler than that. Oh. Just do a hard cap. Just do a hard cap. Hmm. The same, I, I think baseball should have a hard cap as well. I don't like... I don't like the concept of luxury taxes. Just make it a hard cap. Don't let them go above it, and you're fine. Did you know with a hard cap that Cleveland currently wouldn't have the big three that they oh, have? Oh, yeah. Most most teams would not because yeah. it, it's the ability to reassign your own players yeah. above the t- cap is what allows it. Yeah. Them. So I just make a hard cap. Make a hard cap. Don't let you – you can raise it a few million if you need to, but just make a hard cap. And leave it, like or, football. Or even go in reverse. <laughs> See, that's the funny thing is whenever I try to make sports better, is it kind of tends to follow the model of the NFL, <laughs> unfortunately. But what I would do is, like you said, hard cap. And then beyond that, don't guarantee those player contracts. Yeah. Because if they're only working for three years and they're cuttable, that's the difference. Because the Knicks are awful, will be awful, and always have to be awful. Because even when they're bad, like right now, they still have to find another team to take on their bad contract player and get something good in return. But they have to also take in like three players to substitute mm-hmm. their one player with a bad contract. It's a lot of contract mumbo jumbo. Yeah, it's, but, just, it's just a joke. But it, but it's still it makes it hard for when you're bad to get good, and also for players to collude and come together so yeah just make a hard cap anyways would you also agree with mine though i mean like that that also sounds good too i yes and no i don't think like it's a bad idea but i'm not sure if i would love the idea of it 
LeBron would make a lot of money. Yeah, uh, I should, think you'd have 30 players who'd make a lot of money. Yeah. But overall... Yeah, it would never happen. The I'll NBA, say it would never happen, and never. I'm not sure how well it would work for certain teams, like poorer teams. Oklahoma City, maybe. Yeah. Hmm. So... All right, my last question here. A judge granted Abby Lee Miller, this is, of course, the dance instructor at the forefront of the hit TV show Dance Moms, gave her permission to travel from L.A. to New York City this week for three paid TV appearances. According to documents, all three shows booked her after she was sentenced to a year and one day in prison for fraud. It's still unclear when Abby will begin doing her time, and Miller was ordered to pay $160,000 in fines along with the prison sentence. Luke, I want to know if you believe that you could make it out in a prison if you only had a year sentence. And what role would you serve in prison? Would you be like the the snitch for the cops? Would you be the uh, person who sneaks stuff in are, through certain orifices? Are we talking like hardcore murderers and rapists prison? Or are we talking like... Jail. No. Uh, or are we talking like, like blue collar... Or sorry, right. white collar prison. Let's go white collar, like white above collar? rehab. Oh my god, I could easily make it here. Yeah. <laughs> I might prefer a year in print to white collar <laughs> prison. I know a lot of people. Sometimes I've been watching an unhealthy amount of jail shows and prison shows because my girlfriend is a, a an unquenchable fascination for the for those shows. Way to throw a ruby on it. No, she she loves it and she would admit it. So and she loves like Law and Order, all those stuff. And I'm now getting sucked in the vacuum too. Anyways. A lot of those people say, hey, it's the only way we can get three meals a day and, okay. and you know, we get some yard time. We get, you know, close friends. You can make some money. You, and know, you don't also, have to worry about expenses. I would 100% be the guy who walked in the first day and just start beating the crap out of just someone. To prove, just to prove just your... Just to prove I am, I am the big dog. Yeah. Who, who's in here for uh, money laundering? Yeah. yeah. small. <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> okay. All right. Your, your last question here. My last question. Michael Vick... Ah, oh, yes. Former Atlanta Falcon great. Former Philadelphia Eagle great. Michael former Vick. Madden great. For, ultimately the greatest player on Madden if you turn off injuries. Yes, that, that's true. That's very true. Um, But it w- was announced, and I can't believe I'm about to say these words, but it was announced that he would be playing professional flag football. In sort of like a mini comeback attempt into the NFL, I guess. And is he only one year removed? I think so, right? He didn't play last year. I think he's two years removed. No, he played two years ago for the Steelers. That's right. But anyways, um, he is. This is apparently like one of the the newer pro flag football leagues. It's a very new concept. They're still working out some of the kinks, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um. But it's flag football. So this begs the question. Do you think that me and you can just quit doing this podcast and just go try out and become professional flag football players like right now? Um, it was mentioned earlier in the show that you had two knee surgeries or no one knee surgery and very bad knees in general. Uh, I think you're done. I think that you're, you know, maybe a lineman. Maybe you got to get a brace or something. Uh, but it's flag football. And I do not have the girth. I do not have the... I have the endurance. I just don't have the girth. If Even even for flag football, you can still get a little rough and rowdy. I don't have the, the girth. I think that Michael Vick is the ultimate... Because really, what are you doing in, in a flag football game? You're, <laughs> you're turning off the injury button. That's all you're In real doing. life, you're turning off the injury button. So I think that he's perfect for this. This is, this is his realm. He won't be as financially compensated for it as the NFL, obviously. But good for Michael Vick. Go get yourself some money. Hopefully, it leads you to another tryout if you so choose. I'm signing us up for tryouts. Oh, let's go. What are we, the Arizona cacti? I don't know. There we'll, we go. We'll find the team. Spike up. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been fun, Luke. Yeah. All right. Yes, we've got another show next week. Actually... I think, because of scheduling purposes, you'll actually be on twice this week. Ooh. Because you'll be on 
you, I think you're being booted to what now listeners are listening to this week. And then you'll also be talking about yourself ne- next week for us right now in this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they'll be listening to it there. So you'll be on twice next week. Ballin'. Ballin'. All right. Uh, for all of Chopped Grains and for Luke Wright. And I'm Philip Amarin. Thank you so much for listening. Catch us on YouTube and SoundCloud. Bye.